Hey, good looking. It's your boy, the Cynthia Calvillo of Coppinophilio, Jack Slack, Fights Gone By Podcast, episode 209. Coming at you ahead of a, of a weekend of fights that I didn't even know was happening until yesterday because the fights, they were moved back and then they were moved forward again and there were some changes. But we'll get into that later. Uh, I thought it'd be a good idea to catch up on some of the news and moving and shaking that's been going on uh, with booked fights because things are starting to edge more back towards normal or a normal schedule. Um, the shops are opening in June on June 15th in the UK, apparently, non-essential shops. And quick plug for the Dominic Cummings press conference. If you loved uh, uh, Prince Andrew pretending that he wasn't a paedophile, you'll love this. But into the stuff that's happened this week, I think big news, first of all, Henry Cejudo's retirement is apparently legitimate. Uh, He has, he said, peace out or whatever. And the UFC said, best of luck to him. He's been amazing. Um, And they've removed, they've vacated the bantamweight belt. No one's got it now. They're going to do something stupid with it, I guarantee. Maybe Chito Vera versus Dominic Cruz for the title. Um, But uh, yeah, Cejudo's gone. And uh, you know, the, the door is always open for some kind of comeback fight. But like I said in my post-fight analysis of uh, Cruz versus Cejudo, which you should read at the Fight Primer, um, because it was an awesome game plan, first of all. But like, it's very hard to know how good Henry Cejudo was. I, you know, he was amazing, but it's very hard to know exactly where to rate him because of the very strange circumstances his career sort of happened under. Um, you know, he... he Got the win over DJ. People bitched about the win over DJ. Said he wouldn't win a third match. DJ didn't offer him the third match. DJ went to fight nobody's in Asia. And uh, then he fought TJ at, like, dehydrated flyweight. And then he fought Marlon Marias, which is a very legitimate win. Um, And then he fought Dominic Cruz for no reason. So, yeah, kind of odd. But um, an incredible fighter. And the, the improvement he made over the last few years of his career was truly incredible. And he was getting to the point where he was one of my favourites to watch, to be honest. He, he always brought something interesting. And then other sort of like unfight booking related news. Kevin Randleman is going into the UFC Hall of Fame, which is good, you know, awesome. Um, was he, the, he was the heavyweight champion at one point, wasn't he? Yeah. Obviously, someone who had an enormous amount of potential and didn't live up to it, um, but still a very exciting fighter and a key a key factor in some of the big matches in Pride and the UFC um, in his era. What else we got going on outside the ring? Tom DeBlas signed with one. I mean, that's only interesting because... I mean, if you've never seen Tom DeBlas... Tom DeBlas trained some awesome grapplers. He's Gary Tonin. He's, he was the original coach of Gary Tonin um, and Gordon Ryan. And, uh, yeah, and he makes it to ADCC every year, either by the trials or invitation but he is incredibly boring to watch as a grappler. He sits in half guard and does nothing for the entire match. Uh, his his match with Orlando Sanchez is agony. Um, but he was in the UFC like before he got super famous as Go- uh, Gary Tonin and Gordon Ryan's coach. I mean, it's one. So they'll either s- sign him to fight bums and he'll win or they'll sign him to fight bums and he won't even look impressive. Um, but he will brag about how humble he is constantly and how he's still training during the COVID epidemic. And how he thinks he's already had COVID. Edson Barbosa appealed the loss to Dan Ige. And naturally, I mean, you know, you're not even dealing with a real commission in Florida. But whatever assembly of uh, inbreds and yokels they have down there got together and laughed at Edson Barbosa for trying. I mean, you know, appealing a bad decision. You, you can't appeal like flagrant fouls that weren't called. You're not going to be able to appeal a bad decision. So unlucky, Edson, um, but you looked all right at featherweight, so keep it up. Then Islam Makachev came out and poo-pooed the idea of fighting Drew Dober. Uh, Kind of annoying because, you know, Islam Makachev has been rumoured to fight everyone and then the fights haven't happened. Um, But I suppose the interesting stuff is all these fucking bookings we've got. Uh, Sterling, sorry, Aljamain Sterling versus Corey Sandhagen has been booked and that is an absolute banger. No interim or, or regular title on that. I mean, both very capable of fighting for the title uh, now that it's vacant, but nope, nothing like that. And I think we're only getting three rounds out of that too, which is even more annoying because of news we're going to have in a second. But other interesting bookings, you've got O'Malley versus Wineland. I mean, Wineland's been around for ages and is kind of washed at this point, but faints a lot. And that's always interesting against a counterfighter like O'Malley. You've got Lyman Good versus Bilal Mohammed. Mm, interesting. I thought Mohammed was looking pretty good in his last one. And Asun Sal versus Garbrandt has been moved to UFC 250, so that fight is still on the books. 
because a Sun Sao is the least likely person to knock anyone out. So Garbrandt might be able to get back, you know, at least on the at least on the not getting knocked out column. Alejandro Pantoja uh, has been booked against Al- Askar Askarov. Fun little flyweight fight. Uh, Maurice Green has been booked against John Volante. Who the fuck cares? Andre Feely against Charles Jourdain. That'll be interesting. Um, Frank Camacho against Matt Favola. I mean, Frank Camacho never has a boring match. Pedro Munoz versus Frankie Edgar, I thought was quite an interesting one. Because Frankie Edgar kind of, you know, on the downward slope of his career, obviously, at this point. But, um, you know, still could pose a difficult matchup to Pedro Munoz. Uh, but Pedro Munoz, you know, big hand, big heavy hands, very slow guy movement wise, but heavy hands and a great guillotine. And the the great guillotine was more than enough for Brian uh, Ortega to stop Edgar from effectively pursuing takedowns. And when Edgar is not able to pursue the takedowns effectively or you know safely, um, the boxing into takedowns and takedowns into boxing just becomes one note boxing. And uh, then he he tends to get hammered or, or has been hammered in the past. You got Shamil Abdur. Abdu- I can never say this man's name. Abdurrahimov versus uh, Cyril Garn, been rebooked for July 11th as well. Same event. Uh, and you've got Keller, uh, Brian Kelleher versus Cody Stamen for June 6th. That'll be a good one too. Uh, and then you've got Jessica I versus Cynthia Cavillo to, to headline a card. What? I know a lot of people tuned in this week specifically to hear me get angry about this. But frankly, if you ever pretended that Valentina Shevchenko's work in the flyweight division was legitimate and worthy of praise, uh, you deserve this. You're pretending that Jessica I was the legitimate number two in the world at one point. Yeah, have her in the main event. Fuck you, that's what I say. Uh, 25 minute split decision to one of these lasses. What I'm really, really hoping, I mean, the funniest thing and the most Jessica I thing would be for them to, because sw- she, she was like tweeting main event, yes, uh, before it was announced. But the funniest thing in the world would be for someone to swoop in and put in a proper main event above them and her to be bumped down the card uh, and to get angry about it. Because it's just so much fun watching her be like, why haven't I been on Rogan yet? <laughs> or trying to start a chant. Um and then the the weird news that you all expected, uh, however, Joseph Benavidez versus Davison Figueredo 2, rematch for July. Basically, do over until Joseph Benavidez finally wins the UFC title. Uh, I mean, it was fucking weird because Figueredo missed weight, but he still smashed Benavidez. And, there, you know, the complaints about the headbutt, the dude didn't lower his head to headbutt Benavidez. Benavidez ran his face onto Figueredo's face. It wasn't like Henry Cejudo trying to nod at him. But, you know, um, can't say too much about it on Twitter because Megan Levy started following me the other week. <laughs> and it was literally hot on the heels of one of my shittiest shit posts of all time. So my plan to shit post my way into the UFC uh, executive branch or whatever, working a charm. But there's all your matchups that have been signed this week. There's probably been a load more since I started this podcast. I mean, it's it's they're banging them out. And I'm not complaining. What I am going to complain about, however, is this card this weekend. Let's have a look. It is headlined by rap god Tyron Woodley and Gilbert Burns, um, who, uh, you know, at at welterweight, still not sold on him. But, you know, actually, this is a perfect chance to revisit what a shit show the welterweight division has become. You've got Usman at the top, who's just fought Colby Covington, uh, who was the interim title holder. Fair enough. That all makes sense. Then you've got Tyron Woodley placed at number one contender, despite a year of inactivity, though he did have that cancelled bout with Lawler and injured his hand. You got Leon Edwards at number four. Yep, fair play. Oh, Jorge Masvidal at number three. Yeah, fair enough. Those guys are basically titled contention, should be fighting each other. But Jorge Masvidal is busy looking for fight number two with Nate Diaz, because that's about the mo- easiest money that you could earn in the sport right now. And it, honestly... Good for him. He should do that. He should just keep fighting Nate Diaz until people stop paying for it and make sure that when they wave off the fight each time or when they announce the decision, he's breathing really hard so that people go, oh, oh, Diaz was in with a chance there. If he just got on him when he was tired or if they just let the fight continue. Then you've got Gilbert Burns at number six, who like I'm still struggling to consider him a welterweight. I mean, he's done some stuff in the division. I mean, was Mike Davis the first welterweight one? No, my Davies was lightweight. They fought Konchenko, who was decent. Gunnar Nelson, who is kind of considered a bit overrated. Uh, and then Damian Meyer. And that that was your lot. You know, and Damian Meyer, he did knock him out in the first round, but he was like also picked up and uh, dunked on his head by a 40-year-old Damian Meyer. I mean, it just goes to show, like, there's guys like Vicente Luke who won a load of fights in that division. And 
took forever to get ranked. I mean, really what it shows you is that you have to be a name in the rankings to be even considered for the rankings. Well, I mean, it's just the retarded way that the um, rankings work. And, and people who are in the rankings almost never drop out of the rankings. Like I was looking at the new rankings and Jeremy Stevens, top 10 featherweight. Last time he won a fight, 2018. And he's fought about four or five times since then. You know, that is not a top 10 featherweight anymore when you have so many other guys fighting good opponents and winning. But at any rate, you've got Burns versus uh, Tyron Woodley. I think this is, yeah, this this has the makings of, like, a disastrously boring Woodley fight. If if, if he comes out that way inclined, you know, he, he has lost the title. He's lost a lot of um, his leverage in negotiations and things. You know, he, he could come out, like, swinging for the fences. But... Um, you know, I'm looking at this and thinking Gilbert Burns, not an amazing takedown artist. I can't see him, um, you know, I can't see him putting the Kamara Usman on uh, Woodley. I can't see him beating up, beating him up in a in like an upright clinch, clinch fight. You know, like a well, I imagine Leon Edwards would probably have a good shot at doing that with Woodley, uh, because Woodley, you know, he he puts his back to the fence, falls into clinches readily, and um. You know, he can hold off takedowns against everyone except the the very best, like uh, Kamara Usman, who just kept going for him. Um, but, you know, he can get a little bit lazy there. I mean, laziness kind of uh, in, in, is the word that I think of in a lot of Woodley's fights. You know, it's, uh, it's a tactical decision to put your back to the fence all the time and then try and run to the centre off it. But... Uh, there are long periods of his fights where he doesn't do an awful lot. And in, I think the thing is that he has done such a convincing job of um, making it confusing when he's going to explode and when he's going to do nothing that he's confused even us, the audience. <laughs> so we go in expecting, we're like, no way, this one can be dull. And then it is. Uh, or, and just when you're ready to say, fucking Woodley fighting again, he knocks someone out, you know, or, or blasts them upside the head a few times in their fight. Which, of course, doesn't help with your um, attempts to generate star power and uh, pay-per-view value. You know, people like a reliable knockout artist. Which is why no one likes Jeremy Stevens, <laughs> Except the rankers. Uh, but yeah, looking at this, I'm just, I'm thinking Gilbert Burns, I mean, he's got a couple of awesome wins by armbar in the UFC. Like a surprisingly high number of awesome wins by armbar in the UFC. And he's done some great stuff from the top. But getting Woodley off his feet and away from the fence to do that like you know uh, Usman was just taking him down along the fence and holding him along the fence to, to really attack submissions you've got to move into positions where you can get submissions uh, rather than just sit on a dude's ankles or, or keep pulling him down when he stands up again and you know Gilbert Burns isn't like a high pace ground and pound guy either both guys you know certifiable bangers I've seen Gilbert Burns knock guys out with both hands Tyron Woodley obviously very famous for his right hand um, pull right hand counter on Darren Till uh, amazing right hands off the fence against Wonder Boy. I think he knocked out Josh Koscheck going backwards. Was it Koscheck? I forget. Obviously dipped in and then came over the top with the right hand against uh, Robbie Lawler. And then some journalist asked him, uh, "Why did you do that? Why did you drop your hands?" <laughs> like, nice. Um, Gilbert Burns does have the low kicks, you know, which could be a factor here. Um, I think the thing is that you know I, I saw him use some really nice low kicks against Konchenko and uh, a couple of others. But I think the thing is, when Woodley stands with his back to the fence and that lead leg out there, he is sort of waiting on the low kicks. You know, um, Wonderboy, round one of their first match, I think it was, backed him onto the fence, threw a low kick. Woodley immediately stepped in so the low kick ran up his leg and drove through on a takedown and got top um, half guard and just leant into Wonderboy and smashed him with elbows. I mean, this is the thing. I'm completely torn about this fight. It has potential to be an amazing banger. has plenty of potential to be just a boring, boring fight. And the rest of the card is not amazing, to be honest. You know, you could get some good fights out of it, but just, like, looking down it as prospective fun. Uh, Blagoy Ivanov versus Augusto Sakai. Fucking what? Kevin Holland's back on short notice. I mean, Kevin Holland's doing what you should be doing if you're not very popular in the UFC right now. Get as many... Take as many short notice fights against people who don't have Wikipedia pages and try and run up that knockout count. Roosevelt Roberts, he's fairly fun against Brock Weaver. Okay. Brock Weaver ranked 130th worldwide at lightweight. Mackenzie Dern's back against Hannah Siffers. I mean, firstly, you've got Mackenzie Dern trying to make straw weight with no one there 
making her do it you know coaches and gyms are closed at the moment except like small you know one-on-one stuff a lot of the places um so that'll be interesting but ray borg managed it so Mackenzie dern could uh but she's fighting hannah siffers and i you know we watched hannah siffers get held down and beaten up by angela lee not angela lee sorry angela hill who is not famous for her top game or her takedowns um so this could be a Mackenzie dern submission clinic Catelyn Jakagian is back after uh, losing to Valentina Shevchenko, getting crucifixed and beat up. Uh, and she's fighting Antonina Shevchenko. Antonina? Yeah, Antonina Shevchenko this time. Antonina Shevchenko, obviously the hotter of the Shevchenko sisters, so people want her to be better, but uh, hit a brick wall in Roxanne Modafferi and uh, lost that fight. And it was, oh, it was glorious. Don't know what to tell you about that fight because I don't care. Billy, Qu- Billy Quarantilo who I hope gets famous very quickly because I want to be Billy Quarantino in my introduction to next week's podcast uh, against Spike Carlisle, who, fucking hell, look at the the picture of Spike Carlisle on um, Tapology is like Seamus from the WWE. He is looking bulky and ginger. Jamal, Jamal Hill versus Clidson Abreu. Clidson Abreu is terrible. Um, you know, it's light heavyweight, so they're both terrible, but Clidson Abreu especially so. Uh, Tim Elliott versus Brandon Royval and Casey Kenny versus Louis Smolker. Smolker and Elliott, always fun, but you might be able to guarantee more fun if you just put a rematch between those two on the card and took the other two to fight each other. You know, uh, Smolker and Elliott had a fantastic grappling match back in the day. And then Chris Gutierrez versus Vince Morales. Don't really know anything about either of them. So, um, you know, hit me up with all the uh, you casual slacky, everyone knows Spike Carlisle. <laughs> but um, yeah no, they're not bringing their best for this one so instead we're going to talk about some questions we're going to answer some questions talk about some cool shit and not dwell on a card which might well turn out exciting but doesn't give you a lot to be excited about beforehand hello dearest slack of the jack a qu- quaternary is that a word of questions for you this lovely evening one what could a man like nate diaz do to optimize his chances at a title run at this point my personal bet is that getting to the level of shape seen when facing Michael Johnson would help would help significantly. Granted, I think little of anything would help him beat the top three in Habib, Tony, and Justin. Oh, we're talking we're talking lightweight Nate Diaz here, not number ten ranked in the world welterweight Nate Diaz. That being said, I can't help but notice what that level of shape did for Nate's speed and his level of lucidness in the Johnson performance. Being armed with this speed, he was both able to land his offensive volume consistently and from from my eye, be much less hittable, which is probably good considering the mileage he has on that coconut of a skull by now. Um, We'll answer the first question first. So, yeah, I don't know if there's a lot that Nate Diaz can do to... I mean, the first answer would be fucking fight more often. Um, The problem is that when he runs... All the things that cost him fights have stayed the same. He's never changed it. Um, he, He loses fights because of footwork, because of his inability to check kicks a lot of the time. Um, body shots have always been an issue for the Diaz brothers too. And uh, just trying to walk down, walk people down and grind them out. You know, the Masvidal performance was a perfect example because Masvidal kicked his lead leg, turned him around, kept him, you know, turning, uh, pivoting, hit him with jabs and right hands, threw loads of low kicks and body kicks, threw some high kicks in there too. If Diaz ever seemed to be getting going, he'd pop into a clinch and then Diaz would be held and, you know, it would be a different sort of fight. Diaz never got to the point where he was opening up with his hands uh, against the fence or anything like that. You know, it's the same as, like, Carlos Condit did to Nick back in the day. GSP on the feet against Nick. Uh, KJ Noons against Nick. Uh, Connor versus Nate the second time, you know. Turning him around and kicking his lead leg. And when he checks the kicks, you just keep moving. Like, that's that's the thing. Dude, sometimes people will come out and try and kick his legs. And he'll pick his leg up or he'll throw a front kick or something. And then he'll step in on them and start punching them. And people go, oh my god, he's, he's fixed the low kick problem now. And you're like, no, because he's still almost side on. When he's picking up his leg to to uh, to kick to check the kicks or kick back you can move around him and that's the whole problem he can't corner people and he can't make them engage on his terms in terms of the michael johnson performance i think people put a ton of stock in that that isn't necessarily like i mean michael johnson has had a ton of bad performances against worse fighters than nate diaz and that was true before the diaz fight you know even then i seem to recall that it was much closer than highlights of it made it seem I think Nate Diaz is an underrated clinch fighter a lot of the time. Well, certainly against Conor McGregor, he looked good in the clinch. And um, Anthony Pettis, too, you know, stepping in, using the head head post, freeing his hands to hit the body and the head. And that's the sort of stuff that would help him because he's not, you know, as much as people rave about his boxing, 
the boxing part of boxing is getting in position to th- to land your hands, and he's not very good at that. Uh, if you just pushed to the fence, pinned the guy there, then freed his hands, he could do that sort of like piling up the punches and, and leaning on his gas tank that he wants to. Two, can you give a boy some advice on applying the DAS? I have a respectable wingspan for my height, but always find my DAS quite useless. I tend to just abandon it once I have it in favour of other subs from the front headlock position. But I am tired of being incompetent at it. The way I usually fail at, at it is by sitting back on it like a guillotine, as I have seen others at my gym have success with it in that way. A um, couple of like different philosophies on finishing the DAS out there. And I think it's like arm triangles. You know, guys have their own way. And it doesn't necessarily work 100% of the time. So everyone sees that as like not being the right way. <laughs> so arm triangles especially can be a, a bit hit and miss um, because a, a guy's upper body build often has some effect on it too. Because remember, you're trying to jam someone's shoulder into their neck, you know, and, and squeeze their neck from the other side with your arm. Um, things that help me. Um, now, see, there's uh, if you watch Ryan Hall's brilliant tape on it, um, he really gets his tries to get his shoulder behind the opponent's shoulder and drive their shoulder up towards their head um and uh, a lot like i had a, a lot of success improving my dars by doing most of the darsing like facing towards the opponent's head to make sure my shoulder was driving their shoulder in um but then you know the traditional way of finishing the dars is to turn back towards the opponent lay down on your side and walk towards their legs um and uh, gordon ryan i think did a good uh, breakdown of that on one of his dvds or on youtube somewhere but he likes to he lock up the dars uh with the opponent on their side and you're on top and then fall down and then fall towards their head off of them and, and pull your arms up into them um and bring your hand up to your shoulder to their shoulder which is exposed by you you like rolling off them i've seen dudes fit well i mean like charles Oliveira. you know he's finished darses and anacondas by jumping basically to guillotine position I think if you're losing it from the front headlock a lot and you're going to other things from the front headlock, you need to get better at the, um, is it the far? Horton Nelson, the far Nelson, something like that. The drain pipe, I've heard it called. The vice grip, Eddie Bravo calls it. But where you go gable grip behind the opponent's head, you know, under the armpit, and then you bring the forearm down on the back of their head and you tilt them over. Uh, and so, some people do it like that. Um, some people do it by... Well, you do that and you pivot on your knee nearest them, away from them, uh, and pull them to the mat that way. Uh, other guys get their shoulder really deep and drop their shoulder and go hip to hip with their opponent and, and force them over that way. But f- folding them down on their side is a big part of getting that ass, um, from the top, at least. You know, what you're talking about, like it, falling to your back is more... Uh, guys call it the slas or the mass, I think. I think it was Mark Lehman came up with it, so it was called the mass for a while. Um but that's where you you get your arm deep and instead of folding the opponent over onto their side, you slide in underneath the arm. Like uh, Tony Ferguson did it to Mike Rio and um, Kakuno and Danny Castillo you know, and all the O's. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, uh, you, that's an interesting position. There's a section on Ryan Hall's DVD, I think it's called Chasing the Dars, about like putting your back to the mat and, and chasing the opponent because you can then turn them over because you're coming in under their arm. Um, But I I think it's good to break it into two different positions. There's, you know, the mass or the sliding DAS or whatever you want to call it, uh, and the top DAS, which is, in my humble opinion, or certainly for me, has been a lot easier to learn and finish on on good guys. You know, keep the top position, fold them down, smash that shoulder in, uh, and really get the shoulder up towards their head before you try and finish the choke or turn back into them or anything like that. But that's just my experience. You know, there's a lot of good content out there by much smarter and better darsers than me. Three, do the most excellent short range counter punches typically evolve from prior brawlers? Brackets like a Pokemon, you woo. Uh, <laughs> fucking hell. I tend to wonder if having no fear of being hit in that appropriate range is the secret source for developing the skill of also being unscathed within that range, uh, looking upon the path of our holy one, Geiji, has taken. Um, Yeah, I think comfort in the pocket really, really helps with making like a a good mid-range counterpuncher, a good exchanging range counterpuncher. And obviously, if you've been hammered in the head plenty and you're not scared of it, that really helps. Uh, I think, you know, a lot of the time, especially, you know, people go into it trying to learn it like, I'm going to be a perfectionist, work on my defense so that I'm barely ever hit, you know, be be super slick the entire time. And that sort of like 
maybe not even fear of being punched, but desire to not get... I, you know, it's you should have a desire to not get punched, but there's a certain degree of comfort under fire you need to have to really be good at um, counterpunching. And, and it shows up, you know, it's very rare to get up to high levels of boxing without real comfort under fire. Um, but when you see it in MMA, it's like a revelation. You go, bloody hell, you don't see a lot of that, you know? Because in MMA, we're still in the in the phase of like, everyone keeps such a long distance that you can just sort of back off whenever someone starts swinging at you. And the problem is you've got to like run to try and hit the opponent. You don't see an awful lot of guys even working in that closer range. So seeing comfort there is, is really rare at the moment. Four, is I... Is Iaquinta just Justin Gaethje zero calories at this point? He appears to be a good anti-wrestler to a similar level of Gaethje, but sorely lacks the considerable power and now masterful range control Gaethje has to deliver his blows. Should he A, go to featherweight to absorb jabs in the face from smaller men, B, reel his face in about 12 inches or so, and B2, possibly learn to karate box, C, work on his pull counter, Work on his pull counter to effectively capitalise on what people correctly believe is his hittable or formerly hittable mug. Cheers, mate. Caleb from Chicago. Great questions, Caleb. Um, Iaquinta, yeah, I think a real lack of variety hurts Iaquinta. Um, it is just the right hand and uh, the the sprawl, you know, and he can he can wrestle offensively sometimes too, but a lot of his game is like take the jab or slip the jab, come back with the right hand. Uh, and, and carrying his fists in front of his chest and his face projected out the entire time. I think if you've got someone working with him who made him a bit more upright, uh, you know, applied the jab, applied the inside low kick. You know, he trains with Chris Weidman the entire time. I think a lot of what Chris Weidman has been doing throughout his career, except the losing part, um, would really help uh, I, I Quintus striking. I think realising that he has a great right hand and, and can take a great shot uh, probably hurt his ability to learn and improve. It'd be fun to see him, um, maybe not like, I don't want to be like, go to Henry Hooft, he'll teach you to kickbox. But it, uh, Hooft's gym often has people like R R uh, Van Roos Marlin or, uh, well, no, the Black Zillions used to have like Van Roos Marlin and um, Nicky Holskin coming through. Uh, I know that Dwayne Ludwig had to Keru come in and, and spar TJ Dillashaw, but, you know, get some good kickboxers coming through. And it would be really interesting to see him like try and adopt a, a more low kick centric style, you know, or combination punching into low kicks, um, because he's he's got such a good sprawl for the most part. You know, very difficult to take down. I mean, Kevin Lee got on his back a few times, but he's also pretty good on the ground at like getting out of bad positions. Um, but he's he's so confident stopping stopping takedowns for the most part. You know, he did he did well stopping takedowns against Habib. He just sort of opened his face up. Well, his face was always open, but he just sort of had to stand there and take punches to do it. But he's so confident sprawling that you might as well just teach him to combination punch into low kicks and things um you know work in flurries at least then you're at least um winning on the judges scorecards and, and and piling up the points by doing that but working in combination would also help him hide his right hand he'd get some attritive damage going through the legs you know his, his left hook would probably improve from working in combination the entire time yeah i think if anything it's like he wants to be a boxer but doesn't really have the jab and other movements necessary to do it he just has slipping in right hands because let's not forget a huge part of gage's game even now even now that the it's not just all low kicks. The low kicks are a big deal. Like you watch Tony Ferguson slow down significantly through that fight. And a lot of what Gaethje does is time the step in as well. And that that if you can slow down the guy's footwork and um, have a nice long range weapon to, to hack at him while he's out there, um, you can really set up those counters more consistently, maybe not as frequently as, as if the guy was just going at his own pace without being kicked in the knees the entire time. But let's consider some of those options. Go to featherweight. Um, if I can make the cut, I mean, Barbosa was pretty big. At, uh, like, well, uh, you know, it's it's always weird doing this. Like, well, so and so did it. You know, and everyone's different. Some people just can't do it. Some people can't function very well at lower weight classes. Some people work just as well, completely skeletally de dehydrated, like a night before the fight. Like Jose Aldo looked absolutely terrible before that Marlon Marais fight, and then came in looking like his usual self. Um, I think a featherweight would be interesting because, you know, it, again, we're talking about like slipping in right hands. It's not like he's bullying dudes into corners or ragdolling them around. I just don't know. He'd just be fighting faster people, probably. B1 real is facing, yes. Learn to karate box, maybe. I mean, get him a bit more upright and working behind um, some other techniques, kicking into his punches, you know, that'd be interesting. 
work on his pull counter. Yeah, maybe but he already does that well. He already slips and comes back with the right hand or pulls and comes back with the right hand. Uh, it's that he's only got that one thing going on that, that is a, a lot of it. Anyway, hijack question for the pod. I heard you mention the last dance last week. I thought it was an excellent study of competitive drive as well as being a, a nostalgia trip for me. Do you have any other favorite documentaries to recommend? They don't have to be sports related. Love the potty. Cheers, David. Um, Everyone was on about how this is the best sports documentary ever, and I, I enjoyed it a lot, but come on. When We Were Kings is still a thing. Uh, that is an absolutely fantastic documentary, which I feel I mention every few weeks on this podcast, but When We Were Kings, just brilliant. It came out in the 90s, but it's filmed 19... Is it 1974? Zaire? Zaire 74? Anyway, yeah, uh, Rumble in the Jungle. And they basically followed Muhammad Ali and George Foreman around and uh, Don King and all the press there, you know, you've got... Um, Norman Mailer, George Plimpton, Hunter S. Thompson was there. I think he's in the background of some of the shots. Uh, you got Archie Moore wandering around. You know, everyone who was anyone was at that fight, and um, yeah, you just get all the background and and everything. And um, Norman Mailer and George Plimpton, as talking head interviews, tell a good story. Uh, and of course, you know, Norman Mailer's The Fight is one of my favourite books of all time, and uh, having him there helps for as much of a dick as he is. You know, but but it's a bloody good documentary. Um, and I think that the fact that it was like a feature film, and I think it won an Oscar, didn't it? Because um, George Foreman helped Muhammad Ali up to the stage to accept it, which was really touching. But, uh, you know, there aren't a lot that have been done with that sort of budget. There was um, there, there are things like, uh, there was a thing called Best of Enemies about Ben and uh, Eubank. Um, and there was a, the, little ki- the Little Prince, The Big Fight, which is about Naz preparing to fight Barrera. And they're showing Barrera, you know, training on Big Bear, looking unbelievably hungry and training his ass off. And then they're showing uh, Prince Nazim beating up some bum sparring partners while Emmanuel Stewart's going, oh, fuck's sake, in the background, and then playing golf at Frank Sinatra's villa. Other documentaries, you know, I'm a mad fan of uh, Sir David Attenborough because he's just the best thing about Britain, to be honest. Uh, until, I hope it doesn't come out that he's a paedophile at any point, but, you know, he was head of... BBC Two for quite a while. If there were much dirt on him, I feel like it would have come out at some point. But you know, a very important person, um, and basically the only person who can talk about the climate crisis, uh, and everyone shuts up and listens. Amazing filmmaking on some of those documentaries. You know, Planet Earth and Blue Planet were incredible, but they've released Pl- uh, Blue Planet and Blue Planet Two and Planet Earth Two, and those are even better. The Life series, Life on Earth, Life in the Arctic, or whatever it was, Life in the Freezer. Um, so many of them. All incredible work. Absolute boy. Netflix is doing loads of great uh, true crime stuff. You know, that one about the mayor who pushed his wife down the stairs. And they're talking about a raptor. And I like over here, we don't call owls raptors. We call them owls. So I'm like, what? <laughs> this lawyer is just going on about how anything could have happened. A-, a raptor could have come in through the window and attacked her. And I'm just thinking of a velociraptor going, what? The Confession Killer was fun. Uh, I mean, Serial, the podcast, if you've not listened to that, the first season was amazing. And now there is like this online community. Uh, the, the Serial subreddit is amazing because it's full of people obsessed with season one. And they've done two seasons since then and they've both been shit. You know, no one cares about them. Th- uh, what is it? Three Perfect Strangers, the one about the triplets separated at birth. That was a bizarre story, but well worth a watch. I I haven't looked at it in a while, to be honest, but... Back when Alistair Overeem was hot shit, you know, like before we, when no one cared that he was just banging the roids and he was going through K1 and he was running through Strike Force and he was coming back to MMA and Strike Force after, you know, winning their title in like 2006 and never defending it and, um, you know, coming to America and all that shit. He had a team of guys around him filming The Ream and the episodes, I've not watched it in a very long time, so, you know, they could still be great, but the episodes around like the K1 Grand Prix and stuff were incredible. It was a very hype time to be a, a fight fan and an Overeem fan. I still haven't seen Senna and I want to watch Maradona, which was by I think it's by the same director. Um, so looking forward to that. People rave about those films to me. But yeah, hit me up with your um, documentary recommendations in the uh, comments because there's oh they're just the best form of media to be honest. And I'm always looking for a, a good one, a new one. Oh, the battered bastards of baseball was good fun too. That was Kurt Russell talking about his dad and the baseball team he owned. Uh, anyway, Jack, cheers, mate. I'm in lockdown here in Seattle, and I'm starting to go and I'm starting to go crazy. Maybe it's just me, but something I do to pass the time is to imagine that I have the job of Sean Shelby and try to come up with fun fights 
that haven't actually been made yet. Let's say you become UFC matchmaker. Sorry, that was in bold. Uh, you become UFC matchmaker. That is my goal. Uh, on a card in July or August. You can't make any title fights, but you are able to make one or two fights in each weight class. What fights do you make and why? Cheers, keep up the great work from Tom. Um, right, we'll skip women's divisions because, you know. But let's have a look down some of these rankings. I think at the top of the featherweight division, sorry, the top of the bantamweight division, anything you do is good fun. Um, but if I could really do anything, hmm. I mean, Aldo versus Cruz I would do because, fucking hell, Dominic Cruz went up a place in the rankings on the most recent rank. What? Um, I would probably do Cruz versus Aldo because, you know, it doesn't have huge repercussions in the division, but that is perfect. Neither of them need huge repercussions in the division. We're doing a fight that would have been awesome five, six, seven years ago, whatever it was, uh, when they were both champions and just came over from the WEC. And uh, we're doing it because it's fun. At featherweight, uh, I am a big fan of Burgos versus Allen. I think that'd be an absolute banger. Mr. Body Shots versus the fast Southpaw kid. Can I offer you Chan Sung Jun versus Ryan Hall, maybe? Oh, sorry, one in each division, so we'll move on. Um, lightweight. I think it's got to be Diego Ferreira versus Islam Makachev. That's just, oh, mwah, banger all over. Welterweight, I'm going to say Stephen Thompson versus Jeff Neal. How's that for you? Middleweight. Uh, buh, 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 buh. Might do Hall, v Hall versus Shabazian. You know, Hall might use, lose. Did they, are they going to do the Jackaray? No, no, the Jackaray one was off. So Hall versus Shabazian might be fun. Or Gastelum versus Hermanson. I mean, there's a lot of fun little fights you can make up in that division. Light heavyweight we're skipping because it's shit. And heavyweight we're skipping it because for, for, it's shit. But yeah, I think you've got some fun ones there. Coming for your job, Sean. Hey, Slacky. After about two years of training MMA and BJJ, I began to train sumo on my country's sumo with my country's sumo team, mainly as an additional form of exercise, but also to possibly discover new techniques. To that end, I wanted to ask, are there any sumo techniques or tactics that you think could have an application in other forms of combat that people perhaps haven't given thought to? Before quarantine started, I annoyed quite a few of my no-gi training partners by doing Neko Damashi before shooting on double legs and started using Hazuoshi, armpit pushing, as a way to deny overhooks and underhooks while jostling for head position. But I wanted to get your opinion as quite possibly the only other person in the world with an interest in both MMA and sumo. Cheers from Argentina, Tom. P.S. Still waiting on that filthy casuals guide to sumo. Um, I think the, you know, the shoving techniques and the... Yeah, no, the shoving techniques are probably the most interesting. And there was... Um, People were moaning in the week about uh, they're going to change some of the rules to college wrestling or high school wrestling to, uh, I think it was to reward, uh, you know, pushing someone off the mat because, you know, uh, any sport where you don't have a boundary, there is always the problem of people stepping off the mats. Like one year, the Olympics, the judo was just people walking around near the edge of the mats. And then if they conceded a bad grip, they just step off the mat. You know? um, so it's always an awkward thing but people were complaining like if you start rewarding people for the other guy going out of the out of bounds you're going to turn it into sumo um but you know sumo is the majority of matches are won on ring out there are still throws and sweeps and cool shit but uh, ring out is the easiest and most effective way to do it and there's about eight different names for the different types of ring outs as in like picking the guy up shoving him this way shoving him that way pulling him past you shit like that but um yeah, hands in the armpits, which is a, you know a common position in nogi for like guard passing and stuff, is a treat. But hands in the armpits and like head in the uh, forehead in the chest uh, is is a great way of shoving people around. But you're seeing more and more guys get to the fence, get to that position, so pull their arms back to have the thumbs uh, web of the hand in the armpit and head on the jawline to free themselves up to start hitting from a, a really advantageous position. Uh, always a fan of that. There's a technique called like casting a net which is like you get an arm drag grip deep in the opponent's armpit and f from like their underhook in the over under and you pull them around by it which doesn't really give you anything if you're trying to uh, take the opponent to the ground but if you can move them like that onto the fence I'm, uh, I think that could po possibly work for you. Grabbing the short still works a treat in most fights <laughs> it just goes unnoticed and then one of the things that I always loved about sumo is that because the average length of the fight is like six seconds um you know, they can go up to like three minutes, dude, to just get stuck in standing clinches and, and gassing all over each other. But because the average length of the fight is about six seconds, um, 
the start becomes the most important part and it's like a, a you know it's like a quick draw duel it's a you've got to decide what you're doing and try and fake out the opponent too so some guys were like uh is it Kiseno, Kiseno Sato who was the first Japanese Yokozuna in quite a while but one of the reasons that the, his countrymen didn't like him was that for big for like high risk fight or, or high stakes matches he'd decide to just like sidestep people as they charged into him at the opening um not bell but you know the, the Hajime call and uh you know, that was seen as like a classless move, even though it's totally legal and pushing people down. Um, actually, Hakuho has this move where he would, I can't remember what it's called. It's like the Aggie something, you know, the rising forearm. Uh, but he would go from the start, which I can't remember the name of, and he'd come up with his forearm and the his forearm rising like an upper rising block in, you know, traditional martial arts, but from underneath his chest. And his other hand would be on the back of the opponent's head. He'd just slam his forearm into the underside of their jaw. And he'd, like, stunned dudes with that. There were dudes who just fell on the floor immediately afterwards. Because that's the thing about sumo. You can smash someone pretty hard with legal techniques. And if you stun them and bundle them over, you get the point for the for the throw or the uh, ring out. You don't. They don't care about the fact that you basically knocked them out beforehand. But yeah, the Hakuho rising up. I'm going to have to do a thing on that, though, now. The Hakuho rising forearm. But um, who's my boy? Fuck, the little guy. But he used to do the clap in front of the opponent's face and then dig underhooks because their hands would instinctively come up towards their face. Oh, man. There's so many cool things like that. And I think those, they're cheese. But if you could do them in MMA or grappling, they're, they're baller. Cheers, Tom. Well, I reckon that'll do us for today because this card, just what's going on? <laughs> it's not an awful lot that I can put my finger on and talk about. Um, but I'll have something coming later in the week, either a Filthy Casuals quickie or an article of some kind. If you haven't checked out the uh, two episodes of Slacky's Film Room we did, we did um, episode one was available for everyone. You can listen to it as a podcast or on YouTube or you can go to thefightprimer.com and it's broken down into individual fights. And that's just our alternate commentaries we did... Um, it was the chat shit get banged edition and it was Conor McGregor versus Nate Diaz one MVP versus Lima. There were some good ones in there. Uh, and then we did episode four, Slack is film four, which was for the Patreon boys. And that was Aldo versus Mendez two. You know, we're getting, we like to go inside baseball for the, uh, for the Patreon boys, get a bit nerdy, get our fight nerd on. But of course we also did uh, Michael Bisping beating Luke Rockhold to take the title, which while not a technical masterclass, was the most important moment in the history of the sport. So if you want to get in on the extra stuff, sign up to the Patreon, support the podcast, be a bro. If you want to send an email to the podcast, fight's gone by podcast at gmail.com. And if you want to see what I'm doing at any time, fightprimer.com. I'm your boy, Jack Slack. Billy Quarantino, bless.